Thanks. Um, so before we get started, a uh, quick show of hands. Who came to Katie Bell's WebAssembly talk earlier? Just get a, get a sense. OK, great. That'll be helpful at the end of this talk. Uh, second, who has heard of Local First Software before? So not offline, just Local First. OK, excellent. Who ha of, of those, who's actually done something with Local First Software? Like side project, production. OK, excellent. All right. So uh, thank you all for coming in the, uh, I would actually say, the, the highly coveted after lunch spot, uh, where you know, you've, you've all gotten your energy back, right? Um, you're, you're ready to, to absorb a lot of information. And for the rest of you who are here to rest and digest, just, just let the slides wash over you. Okay. So we're going to talk about the jump to hyperspace, light speed, user agency, and moving past the cloud. So let's jump in. We've been building apps fundamentally the same way for about 30 years. This is our hammer, and we've seen everything else as a nail. And it's my job today to Kool-Aid man through the wall and say, maybe there's another way of doing things and kind of shake things up a little bit. My name, as uh, uh, was just mentioned, is uh, Brooklyn Zelenka. You can find me anywhere on the internet as Xpeed. And I am the co-founder and CTO at a company called Fission, where we work on local first and distributed technologies. Uh, latest big launch is the Everywhere computer, so you can run uh, compute totally locally or push it out to a server if you need a little bit more power. And programming languages and distrib distributed systems are my jam, so I'm very lucky to get to do what I do. And my team did the uh, classic rewrite it in Rust thing, so if anybody wants a rewrite it in Rust poster after this, come see me. And uh, I do a lot of work in standards, so uh, auth formats, wire protocols, uh, some cryptography, uh, et cetera. So how did we get to the web as it is today? In the early to mid-90s, I often like to say 94, is when the W3C was, was founded, it was assumed that you would have a beige box under your desk and that it wasn't always connected to the internet, right? You'd have to type your phone line to talk to anybody. So you would rent a server somewhere else to do, handle your mail or maybe post a website or a blog, right? And that would run on professional hardware. And you would dial into it from time to time. And because you weren't using it continuously, it made sense for them to scale that up. So they could serve many customers. But now you need access control because this is a multi-tenant system. I don't want you reading my email and vice versa, right? And that service becomes popular, so you have to scale that up horizontally. You put it behind a load balancer. You scale out your access control layer. You do all this replication for the data. And that's a lot of work for a 90s sysadmin. So some of them specialized. And they abstracted this out, and they called it the cloud. And over time, we've turned that into something that's the logical conclusion of the cloud, which is serverless, i.e., more servers. And so it was this way for many, many years. But this also has some consequences. There's, we think about a single source of truth, right? We talk about the database, right? It's also very server-centric. There's full stack development, front end, back end. If you get your 15 minute Rails blog running, it works completely on your machine, but then you have to figure out how am I gonna get it to some hosted service, and you have to now deal with DevOps and Docker and Kubernetes. And this is a lot of stuff to train, to build teams for. If we think that uh, it won't just be our glorious AI overlords uh, in a couple years, so uh, Eric, I'll take that $20 bet. Uh, look forward to sending you a check. Um, then we're going to need to onboard more people into the industry. The LAMP stack was invented in the late 90s, right? So Linux, Apache, MySQL, Perl, then later PHP. And we've been extending this as the nearest tool at hand for a long time, right? We've had to ship everything, including the operating system, around into the cloud because it's the nearest tool at hand. This also means that those specialized services have ended up taking up most of the market. AWS, Azure, and Google run well over half right, of, of our internet infrastructure. And on one hand, this is great. The engineers who work at these companies are 
absolutely brilliant, right? Um, but it means that their APIs are the ones that we get locked into. And unlike in the 90s when we almost, we really dodged a bullet having almost a Microsoft internet and an Apple internet and an AOL internet, and people got together and did standards, that's not the case here. So if we do nothing, this is the direction we're going, which on one hand is not bad, right? Again, really smart engineers, but I don't know if I want uh, Jeff Bezos telling me how I can write software and to set the tone and the, the direction for the software industry going forward. So unless we want this to be the future, we need to maybe do something slightly different. We are, in some ways, performing gradient descent on uh, the entire solution space, technology and web tech. And if we take little steps, uh, we can find, you know, oh, we're going up a little hill, right? And we can find exactly that top. And that's great, right? We know that there's a hill here. If we take larger steps, well, maybe we miss some of the hills, um, but we can explore more of the space faster. So we're relatively highly optimized on one of these hills, and we can't just look around, right? It's like being in a dark room and trying to figure out where we're going. We don't want to end up down in one of these horrible pits, but I don't believe that we are at the absolute maximum of what we could possibly ever have for technology, right? There have to be other parts of the solution space. So when you're looking for these, sometimes you have got to go through things that are less mature and try to find if there's another hill in there. Uh, Peter Van Hardenberg at Ink and Switch has this really nice metaphor, which is right now all software is written as if it's an aircraft carrier. Right? It's really industrial strength. It can do anything. It can go anywhere in the world. It can carry lots of people. You can land planes on it, all of this stuff. And uh, roughly to scale, this is the CNCF uh, landscape. And on one hand, it's amazing that this is uh, valuable enough to support this many products and companies, but also you need this many products and companies to even run this stuff, right? So it's this, this, uh, this, this circle, this cycle. And there are absolutely cases where you need the aircraft carrier. But for a lot of things, it feels like we're writing with a brick strapped to our pencil. You can do it, but it might be a little bit slower and a little bit harder, and you may need to retrain. I would really like to get that bicycle for the mind that I've been promised my whole life. I mostly get around town on a bike. Sometimes I rent a car. If I'm moving, I get a moving van. I've never been on an aircraft carrier. So I'm not writing my software like, I, like uh, it's one. The tools we have uh, affect the way that we think about problems. So uh, there was a uh, competition back in the post in the 60s and eventually solved in the 70s. It took 10 years to do human powered flight. Okay, so no engine other than a human and you know, uh, their, their ability to pedal, right? It took 10 years, but we, in the 60s we knew how to do Flight, right? Here's an airplane, it has wings, it has a little propeller on the front, you know, you get in the cabin, it has some wheels. And the solution looked almost the opposite of this, right? It had the propeller on the back. The wings were more like a glider's wings as opposed to a plane's wings. And it had this very long tube and a wing way out front, you know, several meters way, way out front. And when they asked McCready, the leader of this team, why they were able to solve this, and it took everybody else 10 years, he said, Everyone was trying to make an airplane. We were trying to do human power flight. I'd say, right now, everyone's trying to make Google when we should be trying to build apps, or maybe even better, solve user problems. Today, if you want to put together an app, between your users and your developers, there's this huge stack of things that you have to make decisions about and decide. And you know, from your platform APIs to your uh, database to your server stack, all of this stuff. And again, this is a lot of stuff to build, maintain, right? train people how to use. What I want is some magic set of APIs that kind of like on iOS or Android, right? they provide most things, not everything, but sort of like most things for me, right? but for the networking layer, for the web. Because I want to be closer to my users, I want fast iteration. Um, and I want to lower the barrier to entry. I want more people to be able to get into this industry. So what are our options, right? We're only limited by physics. How hard could it possibly be? Uh, on my way here, uh, I landed in uh, Auckland on a short layover, and 
Uh, my mother actually spent a few years of her childhood in uh, just outside of Wellington. So that's about 490 kilometers. Uh, sending a message between these two should be pretty fast, right? That's you know, in fiber, uh, not that far of a distance. But that's not what would actually happen here, right? In the good case, we would go out to the nearest data center, which is in Sydney, and we would do this round trip. And that's assuming that they didn't deploy the app to US East 2, which is the cheapest one, right? This is assuming that they know that they have users in this part of wor the world and that they want to actually serve them quickly. Now, for sending a message, it's probably not that huge of a problem, but that is a lot of extra time, energy, carbon, and just maintenance, right, on, on that underwater uh, cable, which is about 2,200 kilometers long, which in this case, the math works out really nicely. It's about 10 times the round trip uh, to do this rather than the direct connection. If you remember your uh, grade school geometry, that is not the shortest path. And we're only going out to these data centers most of the time because that's where the data and the compute lives. There's nothing, nothing saying that if I had that locally, that would even need the network at all, right? What if I could take this latency and make it zero? We're also now constrained by the location of the data centers in the world, which are approximately, you know, mainly in North America, Europe, and the far, far east coast of Asia, which makes sense. Data centers are very expensive, hundreds of millions of dollars, really expensive to run, right? And then so you can put them in populated areas and not in uh, uninhabited parts of the world like Central America or Africa, which are absolutely populated. And people there are online, right? If we're gonna talk about population density, this circle has 50 million people in it, which is about how many people we have per AWS data center in North America, in South America, that's one per every about half billion people. And in Africa, it's about one and a half people, uh, billion people per uh, data center. Which again, economically, it makes sense when you have to build these giant data centers, right? The data center in Cape Town is, I believe, the most expensive availability zone, right? Which again, makes sense. They have rolling blackouts, they don't have economies of scale, all of this stuff, right? But it's not very fair for the people in these circles, right? who are online, who are innovating, who are trying things out. And we're also producing data at such a rate and volume, so literally bytes per second, in enough places in the world that we can literally never catch up. So this is a light cone, uh, and when a bit of information is created, we're bounded by the speed of light, so it can't go very far, and over time, that information can ripple out. And again, some information, it doesn't matter if it's really that snappy, right? But for anything that needs low latency computing, so that's factory automation, AR, VR, uh, uh, geospatial data, um, uh, remote surgery, right? The latencies on this are just too high. So sometimes people say like, well, you know, most of my users are in a particular area, and so maybe I can just use the, you know, the, the middle between uh, where I'm producing data. But then A, you're having to do all of this extra math about like, well, how much latency, right? You know, Google has the system called Spanner where they say, you know, after however many milliseconds, then we can accept things because it'll probably be consistent, right? All of this stuff. What happens then when your user picks up and goes to Australia for 10 days? This stops working. Chris Merkel John uh, is a distributed system researcher, has this great paper uh, where he says that as we continue to increase the number of devices, uh, globally, so IoT devices, smartwatches, all of this stuff, is completely impractical for us to look at a small number of data centers as the single source of truth. And goes on to argue that we should treat each individual device as the, the primary site, i.e. The, tr the source of truth. So that means we're talking about consistency. A lot of you have probably heard about the, the CAP theorem. I'm not a huge fan of CAP. Uh, there's uh, PackElk, which is a uh, extension of it, uh, handles some of the, the edge cases. And it says, when you're under a network partition, so two computers can't talk to each other, maybe you're on an airplane, maybe the underwater wire got cut, you can choose between availability or consistency, which basically says your app can be up or down, right? And there are absolutely cases where, you know, if you're disconnected, you want to go down, right? You're dealing with something that has to be fail safe, that can't have bad data written to it ever. That is not 99.9% .9 of applications, right? It's very specialized. Otherwise, so when you do have a connection, 
you can choose between being consistent or latency, being fast. And I would say most people want their app to stay up and to be fast. Today we're going to look at, briefly, uh, AutoMerge, which is a uh, CRDT library that focused on local for software, which is a PAEL system. So always stays up, it's always fast. The source of truth is always your device. We'll also look briefly at UCAN, which is also a PAEL system. And in fact, I would say all local for software is PAEL. Some counterexamples are Google Docs, which is, uh, takes consistency when you're disconnected. So your uh, hotel Wi-Fi doesn't work, and you can't edit your document anymore. It locks you out. It says trying to connect. Or, uh, and I've also seen the, the opposite. I've, I've redacted who, because I'm a uh, much smaller company than Google, uh, is a PAEC system, which says it's always available, but the server can overwrite whatever you have, which is OK, but what happens if there's a bug on the server or somebody gets into your server? Now you have a failure on a computer that you didn't even know existed, rendering your computer uh, unusable, which is, coincidentally, Leslie Lamport's definition of what a distributed system is. Um, which, when you look at local first software, well, if our machine is the single source of truth, then nobody else's computer can tell us uh, can, can break ours, right? So is it a distributed system? Well, yes, absolutely, right? Because we're still going to interact with other people, right? Um, but we are always in control, right? We are always the source of truth. So let's actually talk about what Local First is. So first thing to get out of the way, Local First, very early days, right? Um, we've been working on this for about five years. The original um, paper was uh, published and blog post was published in 2019. Um, and for the past four years, I've been going around and explaining to people what this is, and they, they kind of look at me blankly. And then in the past you know, six to nine months, something's changed, and suddenly people seem to know what this is. And they're telling me about local first software. So there was a Wired article earlier this year. Next to Strange Loop, we ran a, an unconference that we thought, ah, maybe you know, 20, 30 people will come. It sold out. We increased the size of the venue. It sold out again. We had a waiting list, right? So suddenly there's all of this interest about local first software. And you know, it's actually existed before the term was around, right? Apple Notes, Figma, Jupyter, arguably Git. These are all kinds of local first software, right? Where I can keep working offline, I have access to my data, right? Um, and uh, you know, some of these, you know, let's say Git, it's not going to automatically reconcile. So people uh, often associate local first with CRDTs. Git's not going to do that, but it is still. I have a copy of all of my work and all my branches. If GitHub goes away, I'm not totally screwed. Right? A couple of things that are explicitly local first. So this first one on the left uh, is a Dropbox clone that we did in 2019. Uh, so uh, passwordless login, runs entirely in your browser, doesn't require a server at all, though you can back up to a server, um, works offline. And on the right is upwelling from Ink and Switch which is a collaborative document editor uh, where you can also turn off connectivity to other people. So your Wi-Fi is still working, and you say, ah, you know what, I'm tired of people typing over me. Pause them, I'll make some changes, and then you can reconnect and have fully interactive software again. The original uh, article about Local First proposed these seven ideals. And the fourth one has been an absolute slam dunk. This is what most people think of when they think of Local First software. Seamless collaboration with your colleagues. Because when you hear Local First, you think offline, right? So a lot of work has gone into, well, it's local, I have a, a copy, but we can still interact. The rest of these, no spinners, work at your fingertips, so very fast, right? Latency sensitive. Um, your work is not trapped on a single device, right? We can sync. Your, the network is completely optional. And security and privacy by default, so there's a little chart there. You can never have something that is purely, you know, completely secure. But it gets you a lot further immediately. You don't have to solve this for every individual application, because we do things like encryption at rest. The long now and retaining ultimate control and ownership of your data, we're not going to talk about. Just don't have time in, in the, the time slot. I've also heard this described as depth, desktop computing. So uh, you know, 80s, early 90s, was personal computing 
cloud computing is impersonal computing, and local first, or lo-fi, is intrapersonal computing. Right? We care really about individual people and how they collaborate with others. This does mean you have to think about how software works slightly differently. So a lot of people think about the, your computer as being a cache for the internet. That's where all the data lives, all the apps live, and you're just getting a temporary view of that. Local First adopts more of a peer-to-peer -peer or a cellular uh, topology where you have a bunch of instances and they can all talk to each other. And it can be very messy and we embrace that mess. But at any time, you only have to think about two nodes, right? And while this looks very, very peer-to-peer -peer, and you can absolutely do you know, IPFS, BitTorrent, whatever, uh, you can also put this through a sync server. So that purple arrow is doing a lot of heavy lifting there, right? If you want to keep it you know, really simple, have a sync server. Um, but with the advantage of it's now just dumb storage. It doesn't have to do all of this logic. All the logic that runs is going to run locally, which means you now have a choice of sync server. You can move it around. So if one of the services goes down, you can self-host, you can move to a different one, everything's okay. This reminds me a little bit of the uh, original principles for the internet, right? Which were uh, decentralization, Right? So if one of your uh, data centers gets, I mean, uh, literally uh, atomized by an atomic bomb, right, uh, which was the threat model, uh, the network as a whole stays up. Non-discrimination, bottom-up design, universality, and consensus. Consensus of standards, not uh, like blockchain consensus, right? And if we look at the OSI model, this is really great for the bottom three, you know, the media layers, maybe, maybe even layer four. But I would like something that does a better job through the host layers as well. If we take that and you know, reflect it back into local first, well, then there's these four uh, similar principles that go all the way down to the user, not just hosts, right? We should be able to empower users to participate. They should have the option to move service providers or leave, control access to their data, right? and provide capacity to others. Anybody should be able to become a service provider. If that's running uh, you know, a little server uh, under your desk for you and your roommates, or you know, all the way up to a professional system. When we got started with this, we thought, we've been doing the web for a long time. We know how this works, right? You have data at the bottom, data feeds into compute, and then on top, you slap on some auth, right? Because it's a, a little bit like you know, a back-end web framework. And that fell apart basically immediately. So this model didn't work for us anymore. We had to put auth at the bottom, because if your data is moving around, your access control also needs to move around with the data. And now your auth supports the data layer, and the data supports the compute layer. And my goal today is to give you a high-level intuition of these three layers. We're not going to be doing a deep, deep dive into them. If you're interested in more of a deep dive, there's talks from Strange Loop last year and this year on the data layer and the compute layer, um, respectively. And there's also one other layer that um, gets talked about in those talks as well, uh, called managed effects. We're really not going to touch those here today. So uh, you work on the web. It's 2023. Welcome your distributed systems engineer. right? Uh, I like to sometimes call this uh, disorderly systems instead of distributed systems, literally out of order systems. And this is really scary, right? Because we're used to being able to uh, trust our code that I say this sequence of steps and they will execute in that exact order, right? But now we're doing something where we don't have control over order. It's going over the network. We can have dropped packets, partial failure, all of these problems, right? So to put this in pictures, here's your user agent. They have a request with a TCP, HTTP, and some JSON. And it goes out to the network. And it's a mess, right? Uh, you have partial failure, out of order delivery, repeat messages, unbounded latency, right? Uh, network partitions, all this horrible stuff, right? And you're expected to handle this, right? I thought TCP was supposed to do that for us, right? It doesn't. And you know, I'm up here and I'm saying, ah, you know, disconnect from the network, it's fine. And we know what happens when you work when you're disconnected from the network, right? You get merge conflicts. Merge conflicts aren't fun. Are you going to have to merge, uh, do a manual merge on everybody's data all the time? Are you going to have to bother the user continuously? Or even worse, uh, on, uh, in Apple text edit, 
if you've concurrently edited something and you come back online, it says pick which version of the document you want. It doesn't even give you the option to merge them. Right? Good news is that there's a criteria for determining which problems can be automatically merged versus not. It's called the COM theorem. And it's the, it says that a problem has a consistent, coordination-free, distributed implementation if and only if it's monotonic, which is quite a mouthful, so let's break that down. Consistent. By the time we finish whatever the algorithm is, we will all see the same data. It's coordination-free because I don't have to ask you, what do you see right now, and do we have to agree on A or B? It'll happen automatically for us. And we can get this if and only if we can uh, phrase our uh, problem as being monotonic. So what is, what is, what is uh, being monotone? I'll give you a couple examples. So the max function, if I take the max between 1 and 2, it's 2. And then I try it against 42, it's 42. And I try it against 10, it's still 42. I try it against 11, it's still 42. So I'm only ever increasing this number. It's never going back down. It doesn't matter what order I did these in, right? I still would have ended up with 42 at the end, without coordination, as long as we saw the same messages. Let's add items to a set. So here's my empty set. I add 1, I add 9, I add 4, I add 9 again. It's already in there, so that's fine. And I'm only ever putting information into the set. I'm never removing it. So again, we could have swapped these around. We could replay these messages. All of these things, all of that messiness from, uh, from the network, we can just hide with some nice data structures and algorithms. Something a little bit closer to what you'll see in uh, you know, a distributed systems uh, textbook is uh, a bunch of people trying to coordinate on, uh, in this case, they're going to mix colors based on some really basic rules, right? So it's a, sort of a si simplified uh, paint merging uh, system distributed. So uh, here's Alice, Bob, and Carol, and time goes uh, left to right. And they're just going to send messages to each other, and we'll all agree at the end. And you'll see that the latency between them is different. Some of the messages of you know this green and, and yellow are out of sequence, right? Coming from from Alice, and we all ended up at brown, right? So yellow and blue is green. Green and yellow is still green, right? Um, and despite this yellow coming way way at the end, that's fine because it's actually uh, already captured in the brown from, from the green previous message. And even if we started sending around a bunch of messages about our current state, because I'm not sure if everybody's already synced with me or not, you know, it doesn't do anything, right? We would still stay in the same state. And you can scale this idea all the way up to really arbitrary data. So AutoMerge is a library that does this for JSON documents. And it hides all of that complexity under a relatively familiar inter interface. So you just wrap uh, automerge.change on some document. And then you can do things like splicing text, uh, incrementing counters, uh, changing the values at certain keys, even nested values automatically, uh, doing list manipulation, right? All of this stuff, it feels relatively natural, right? So we can hide all this complexity under nice interfaces. But that's all the data layer, and that's the part that people are usually interested in. Let's talk about the scary access control layer. One of my all-time favorite quotes is that cryptography is a tool for turning lots of different problems into key management problems. And if you've ever had to do key management, this should scare you to your core, right? But if you solve key management, you have this fantastic abstraction layer now, where you don't have to come up with custom solutions all the time and it works everywhere and it travels around with the data. So for read control, in a world where data doesn't live at a particular location, right? it lives wherever you know, the user has it, and maybe it's even replicated, that means that it's no longer a network of data centers and servers, it's now a network of data. So we already have this, right? We have links online, right? You can also have hash linked things. And different users should be able to see different parts of the sort of global data stew, right? And maybe I want to pass around the ability for people to see some parts of it but not others. That sounds like a tall order. So there's a bunch of techniques for dealing with this. We're going to talk about Cryptree. Uh, this works on any graph, but I'm going to use a um, file system uh, just because it's something we're all familiar with. And the idea is really simple. Every node, so every file and every directory, has a custom, unique 
uh, symmetric key. Okay, so as an AES key, typically, or, or X cha cha. And all of the directories have all of their children's keys as well. And then recursively, uh, you can find things. So if I give you access to the one key for photos, well, now you can discover the key for Yao and the key for coffee.jpg, right? You can't see anything in docs or notes or the root because you don't have those keys. You have no way of discovering them. Furthermore, you probably want people to not see the entire history of every directory that you've written to, right? Sometimes you put things in the wrong directory. So we want to give them access to things in points in time and ranges in time or, or onwards. So uh, you can hash the key, so it's a one-way function, right, where you can't get back, to derive new keys as you make changes to directories or files. And what that lets you do now is you can now take uh, give access in space, so I can give you access to the Yao directory over a period of time for either a slice of time or not going back past a certain point. So, okay, that's great. You know, we can protect things that are being read. What about writes? What about mutations? What about sending email, right? All of these other things. Most people are familiar with access control lists. So here is uh, Bob the farmer who wants to access some service. And as that goes along, it's stopped by a bouncer who says, show me your ID. Cool, you're Bob the Farmer. Is Bob the Farmer on the cool person list? Yes, you are. Great, you're allowed through. Right? And in some ways, this is really great. Right? We've broken things into three steps. And we can put this guard in the middle. Right? The downsides are that, well, Bob and the service aren't in control. Right? The source of truth is this process and whatever state it has, and whatever current bugs it has, and whoever else is in that system. And the uh, access control logic, which I'm not sure if any of you have, ha have ever had to write uh, a bunch of auth rules for a GraphQL system, not only does it slow the query down, but it gets really hairy, right? We have to maintain all of those and replicate them around, right? And now we have the same problem that we had before. We have this central point of failure that is a choke point for all of these users and all of these apps, right? Another model is called capabilities. So if anybody was in the WebAssembly talk earlier, uh, WebAssembly component model also uses a version of capabilities that's actually compatible with this. Uh, this is the distributed version. So you have a user and you have a service and the user has a ticket. So this is a little bit more like going to a movie theater. Right? They don't ID you on the way in. You bought a ticket. You waited some period of time. You went over to be let in, and they looked at the ticket. They said, oh, yeah, great, Barbie movie theater two. Right? And that's it. Everything that you need now is contained in your ticket. Right? All the required info. This doesn't live in a database somewhere. Right? That is your source of truth. Where the movie theater uh, analogy breaks down a little bit is you can make copies of these tickets. I guess you can still make copies of movie theater tickets too. Maybe you shouldn't. Um, or you can take them and say, well, you know, instead of it being the whole movie festival pass, I can take certain ones out and hand them to my friends because maybe I can't make it that night, right? And I can move those around and transfer authority without transferring keys, without transferring a password. So here, Alice has granted Bob the ability to do some action with a copied, uh, delegated, actually, uh, certificate, who can then uh, pass that back, right? So surely this is some really scary, you know, custom cryptographic format, right? It's a JWT, an extension called UCAN. It contains some public keys, a description of what you're allowed to do, and a copy of, in this case, this is Bob's, um, Bob's JWT, uh, a copy of Alice's as well, so that we can trace through who gave who access to what. This also simplifies the overall uh, architecture, right? So here we have a user, an application, an auth server, and a uh, resource server. So the application wants access to the, say, photos in the resource server. And in OAuth, you do a bunch of setup, right? It's whatever, eight or so steps uh, to get a token into the application. You have to talk to both the auth server and the, and the user. And then it goes to use it, and both sides still have to go back and talk to the auth server. Right? If we get rid of the auth server, i.e. the guard, 
we can simplify this quite a lot, right? And I'll even color code them to be the same steps, right? So we've gone from, I can't remember, 10 or 12 steps to four. Now, auth accidents do happen, right? So even if you've granted somebody access to something, you know, maybe their computer gets hacked, maybe they, you know, uh, you're on bad terms with them and they want to get into your stuff, right? So we call this a Byzantine condition. And so just like this, this poor guy who was giving a, a BBC interview at the beginning of the pandemic, his kid's probably allowed to go into this room most of the time, but maybe not while he's giving a BBC interview, right? So sometimes you still need to be able to pull somebody's rights back right, after the fact. Now, we were talking about monotonicity earlier. This is fundamentally a non-monotone scenario, right? So there are solutions for this. Come see me after if, you, if you're interested. But we'd still have to interact with non-monotonicity non in, in local first. And finally, compute. Uh, or we, as we say, goodbye cloud, hello crowd. So we want compute to run absolutely anywhere. I want the same thing that I run locally to be able to run on a server, right? And again, if you came to the WebAssembly talk this morning, uh, you know, Shopify does this where you know, they can take uh, uh, Wasm submitted by users and it runs in this nice sandboxed environment that's you know, safe for them to run. So same basic idea, we have arguments and some Wasm. And WebAssembly is also just data, it's just bytes. We can move it around, right? We can cache it. And I can wrap the arguments and the WASM up uh, in a task with a little bit of scheduling information, some, you know, some hints. And this together is a little bit like having a closure, right? So uh, an anonymous function that in this case says alert, right? Hello world. When we create it, nothing happens. I get this handle back, you know, this message, right? This variable where nothing happens when I hand it around until I use those parentheses. And then it uh, does the, the alert. And when that happens, we get back a receipt that points at the hash of the task. So it's basically memoizing over the arguments in the WebAssembly. Any values, any next set of uh, tasks that it wants to queue up, and any metadata, any trace information that comes out of it. And again, you'd expect this to be some scary format. It's not, right? It's basically an abstract syntax tree. So we have the URI of the thing being run. So in this case, we've put this on IPFS. Don't worry about it too much. This could be any URL, right? We're saying call wasm run on it. Call the add one function on this module with the argument 42, right? Great, and that'll run locally. That'll run, run remotely, no problem. But what if I have a bunch of these and I don't want to go send that out and then get the result back and then send that out again and get the result back? I want to either give an entire workflow or if something's long running, it's going to run for 10 hours and like, oh, you know, when that finishes, I don't want to have to be online. I wanted to also do this other thing. Well, you can give it an await with the hash of some other task that you're waiting on. And that doesn't matter if it's running now or in 10 years or if it's already been run, it's the same hash. If I run it, you run it, doesn't matter, right? So now we have a way of linking invocation in a distributed setting. So we can build up graphs of computation that don't say anything about where it's going to run, just these are the things that I want run. So we've taken away from the programmer, go to this specific machine and run this exact thing, and we're saying, no matter where it runs, this is what I mean, and pipe them through like this. And now you can have a scheduler that looks around at the network and says, ah, this step needs uh, a petabyte of uh, environmental data. So instead of pulling that all down and computing on it locally, I'm going to push this little bit of WebAssembly over to it. It can run it and return to me a result. Or vice versa, I have some complex program and I just need to grab you know, a photo. Well, I'll pull that photo down. And so it can schedule and know where, intelligently, things should run, regardless of where they go. And it's safe for the people running it because it has this nice sandbox indication model. Because we're creating uh, receipts at every step now so that we can pass things back and forth across the network. And all of this computation is deterministic, right? Because if I run it or you run it, we get the same result. Well, now we've built a global memoized store, right? So if somebody else needed one of these steps, they could either run it themselves, let's say that they're offline, right? They can run it themselves and that'll continue to work. If they want it faster and they know of somebody who has the result, well, they can just skip it and pipe it in. 
and that will continue to generate more receipts. So when we look at trying to parallelize uh, computation, you have throughput on the y-axis and parallelization, you know, adding more machines, right, uh, on the x-axis. And what you want is this, you know, perfect linear, linear relationship between the two. But you find that that's not usually the case, right? You know, you have dropped packets, you know, some uh, coordination, all of this stuff, right? So you lose a little bit of, of uh, efficiency. And actually, it's, it's worse than that in practice, right? So universal scaling law, um, you have, you know, you're waiting for data, somebody give you bad data, their data's out of date, all this stuff. There's actually a maximum and then it gets worse on the other side. But if your data is highly parallelizable and deterministic, well, the more people running stuff now, the more receipts you have. And really popular data, or really popular computation, should be more available, right? A little bit like how BitTorrent, really popular data, when we're downloading our totally legal Linux ISOs, right? Um, they download really fast because lots of people have uh, a copy of Ubuntu, right? Same thing for receipts with computation. We also, uh, the designer at Fission uh, coined the term run once and run never again. Right? Uh, we've now basically created a reverse lookup table from the input hash, so the task hash, to the output. So anybody who has a receipt that's, that's serving online. One use case for this is instant AI. So I have a movie, I want to check, you know, run AI over it, do a classifier, is this okay to post? And 100 people have run it before. Why would I run it again? I can just check. Do people I trust believe that this is an okay thing to, to look at? Yes? Great, right? Tagging all of these things, right? You can do transitive trust models with this, basically people attesting to the safety of, of information or that they trust a particular public key. You can do resizing, cropping images, so you don't always have to serve the same you know, 50 megabyte high res image to everybody. If they have a small phone, the first time it gets resized, those are arguments into the task, and the next person with that phone can pull that from them. And we get durable execution everywhere. So if halfway through uh, executing the computer crashes, there's a power outage, everything fails, you still have your receipts. You don't have to start from the very beginning. You can pick up from where you were and keep going. Or if that's timed out and you know, it's somebody else's machine, it times out, you can say, well, maybe they can run it for me instead, or maybe I can run it myself. So where do we go from here? We've had this hammer for a long time, and now we have a hammer and a wrench. Or if you prefer, you have an aircraft carrier and a bicycle. And you can move between them for things that are appropriate. Turns out that reasoning from first principles, rather than what you happen to have at hand, can be kind of useful. Local first software gets you scale, user agency, and simplicity in your tech stack. But it is early days. So if you're the sort of person who likes to tinker and innovate on things, or even an early adopter, this is a really great time to get involved. And uh, two sites that you can also just Google local for software, there's quite a few uh, options now, but automer.org or odd.dev are great places to start. We've been told for a long time that your option is to be a front end or a back end developer, maybe DevOps. And what they didn't show you um, in the matrix, because you know, they always cropped the frame down, was that there was actually a third hand just out of frame. Right? So maybe we have other options. And the constraints of these systems changes what we're able to do with them. Right? They have different degrees of freedom. So when we had personal computing, you owned all of your software. It came on floppy disks, or you typed it in. Right? But it was kind of limited as well, right? Never mind that it was only you know, a monochrome screen, right? It wasn't connected to the, the network. These days, we can do, you know, in, in uh, this case, it's a distributed watch party you know, during the pandemic, right? That's pretty cool, but we rent all of our software. And if a server goes down somewhere, you're locked out. So local first, we haven't quite figured out what all of the different degrees of freedom are. We know that it's really great for doing offline first things for doing collaboration, for owning your data, but there's still a lot more to be discovered. So I'm really excited to see what you all do with it. Thank you. <laughs>